I'd like to thank um, the members and guests for coming here today. Uh, first of all, I'm Chris Moberg. I'm one of the new 1L representatives. Um, I'm one of several in the class, so um, it's kind of one of my first times being here, too. Um, I'm just going ahead and introduce the Federal Society and what it stands for and its goals. Um, just mention a couple of events we have coming up, and then I'll introduce the speaker and get this whole thing started. The Federal Society is a nonpartisan conservative and libertarian organization dedicated to freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. The Federal Society seeks to educate the legal community through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government, based on the rule, the rule of law, can have a positive effect on law and public policy. Uh, we have a few upcoming events. The one I'll mention today uh, is uh, tomorrow at 12 noon in McCormick 195, which is Strong Hall. Uh, we have an Obamacare debate. It's between Ilya Shapiro and Andrew Koppelman, uh, just to give some feedback and context of what that discussion is about. So feel free to stop at uh, 12 noon there, and we'll be sending out an email regarding that if you have any questions. We have a couple more events, but um, I'll just say that we'll send out follow-up emails, and um, I just want to get going with the speaker now. Today we have Professor Gary from University of South Dakota School of Law. Professor Gary is the director of the Hageman Center for Legal and Public Policy Research. He's the author of num numerous books, including Conservatism Redefined, A Creed for the Poor and Disadvantaged. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Gary. Thank you. It's good to be uh, here in Chicago. I come from South Dakota, and uh, you know, Chicago is a windy city, but South Dakota is the windy state. Uh, so I'm, I'm well used to the kind of uh, the weather that you oftentimes get here. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, I authored a book called Conservatism Redefined. Uh, I wrote it following the 2008 election, um, and in it, I posited that. Conservatism was about to enter sort of a long phase of, of rethinking and, and reinvigorating, uh, sort of much like it did during the uh, 1960s. Um, uh, and what surprised me, of course, was that 2010 uh, seemed to have a, sort of a, a, a surprising turnaround, and rather quick turnaround from uh, 2008. Uh, I think if you... Um, uh, in fact, that sort of result seemed to indicate that perhaps um, uh, the country had either uh, uh, dismissed or forgotten about its concerns in 2008, and that that, uh, that uh, conservatism was sort of back on track. Um, but I think when you take a look at the current uh, presidential uh, uh, campaign, you certainly see a, a host of problems that the Obama presidency is uh, facing. Uh, in this re-election. Uh, you tend to see uh, polling results from Gallup poll. Gallup always does a, a, a sort of a large kind of, kind of social issues, social attitudes polling once a year. And in that, in the most recent uh, polling that Gallup did, really shows that the public, on, on, on many sort of social type of issues, tends to favor the conservative line by a rather significant uh, margin. Uh, and then, of course, you had the, the uh, really significant Republican victories back in 2010. So if you put all that together, you kind of wonder, you know, why isn't, in this case, the Republican challenger doing so much better against the incumbent um, uh, than the race currently uh, stands? Uh, and and I, I think what I argue is that the reason it isn't is because, in a way, there was some significant uh, doubts uh, that the public had back in 2008 uh, and I don't think conservatives or Republicans have faced those uh, kind of doubts uh, adequately. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, because they haven't, because there was a, a sort of break of connection, a break of trust with the average person, with the, with the middle class uh, in 2008, it's left really conservatives uh, and Republicans sort of open to um, some, you know, sort of age-old criticisms um, and uh, open to sort of an, an age-old image problem that it's had uh, for uh, maybe the last uh, 80 years. Now, when I talk about, I, I'm, I'm talking to, to today about conservatism, but I suppose one has to also it, uh, look at the Republican Party uh, uh, to some degree in connection with that. But we all know that political ideologies don't often match up with, you know, partisan politics. Uh, 
uh, many liberals will obviously claim that the Democratic Party doesn't always represent you know, a, a liberal agenda or a liberal philosophy. The same can be said of, of conservatism and the Republican Party. But nonetheless, between the two parties, the Democratic Party is the more liberal, the Republican Party is the more conservative, and oftentimes, the political ideology sort of live and die based upon the success of their, you know, partisan uh, political parties. So to the degree that the Republican Party uh, has problems, that reflects, as we saw it did back in 2008, uh, on the uh, conservative uh, agenda. So I'm going to try to talk about conservatism, but one can't sort of escape the, that, the connection between conservatism uh, and the Republican Party. So. What happened in 2008 then, um, uh, what I'd argue is that, that, that there was sort of a, a breaking of connection, a loss of trust uh, uh, by the public in conservatism, in the um, Republican Party, leaving it open to, to sort of the age-old criticism then that, uh, that uh, the Republican Party and conservatism is concerned really only with the rich and uh, powerful. And this was a, this has been a, a an image that's been around really since the New Deal. Uh, uh, the New Deal was uh, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's response to the Great Depression. Uh, President Roosevelt was elected in 1932. Uh, and uh, what's instructive to notice is that up until that time, between uh, the presidency of, of Abraham Lincoln and the presidency of, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, there were only two individuals who were Democratic uh, uh, presidents. So it was really an overwhelming time of at least Republican Party uh, ascendancy, um, and yet the, the New Deal really sort of wiped that kind of pattern out. Uh, and uh, for many years then following that, both Republicans and conservatives were really kind of fighting a rearguard kind of action because of the uh, image at, uh, that had been prevailed from the New Deal. Obviously, Republicans were in power at the time of the Great Depression. That's going to have a significant effect on, on political standing. But I think also is that conservatives at the time really weren't able to, to mount an effective response to the, new, to the Great Depression problem. Much of their arguments based upon structural matters about what about what the society and economy, uh, how it would work out sort of if left alone, uh, the dangers of too much government intervention. Um, I'd argue given sort of recent histories of the New Deal that perhaps in the long run that uh, the conservative response might have been the better response. But in, in reaction to the kind of uh, crisis that was occurring at that time, it's just pretty difficult. Uh, not to be able to offer some bold action in response to a truly calamitous event uh, like the Great Depression. I think conservatives were uh, a little vulnerable going into the good, uh, New Deal. I argue in my book that, uh, that uh, when, when Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the former president, ran on his uh, uh, third party uh, campaign in 1912, that he sort of siphoned off what was then called progressive, and, and the term progressive meant something much different than it does today, uh, it sort of siphoned off this progressive sort of element from republicanism and, and conservatism. Um, I'd call it a kind of reformist activist type of, of spirit. Siphoned that off, sort of again, leaving what was left of, of the Republican Party, leaving what was left of, of, of conservatism with a kind of status quo type of orientation. And of course, this status quo orientation did not help republicanism or uh, conservatism uh, during the New Deal. And hence, not really having a response to it, uh, conservatism uh, languished for quite some time. Um, I, I, Leading up to the 1960s and the Great Society, conservatism was probably at its worst uh, level, uh, with uh, uh, commentators of all kinds sort of uh, pre uh, predicting that conservatism uh, was a, a, a dying or even dead political ideology. But it was in, during that time, and that's a very interesting uh, period of history for conservatism, uh, because it was in that time that conservatives really sort of had to. Uh, rethink and reinvigorate their political uh, agenda. 
Uh, so two things were really going on in the 1960s. One, of course, is that you have this really rethinking of what conservatism was going to mean and how conservatism was going to address the problems and the issues uh, confronting uh, the country. But in addition, of course, you also had uh, uh, the uh, the uh, excesses of a long period of sort of liberal reign come due and, uh, and sort of turn the country against uh, liberalism. Well, we all know the sort of the most modern history of conservatism, uh, the sort of the reinvigoration and, uh, in the 1980s and, and, and the uh, sort of the, the, the revival of conservatism uh, brings us up to the Bush presidency and uh, uh, certainly I think there's many who would argue that the Bush presidency couldn't, wouldn't necessarily be categorized as a conservative uh, presidency, given some of the um, policy directions that that, that presidency uh, took. And the, uh, uh, the, the Republican Party suffered uh, big losses in 2006, 2008, uh, and of course that translates into uh, public attitudes towards uh, conservatism. But I think one of the lessons too is that um, by that time, and, and I sort of witnessed this as the Bush presidency wore on, is that I, I thought looking at really conservatism really ever since the 1960s, it had been, become a very vibrant type of, at least intellectually vibrant uh, philosophy uh, and ideology uh, with uh, constant debates and, and a really a, a, an eager uh, desire to explore the, the tenets of conservatism and how to address certain problems. I tended to see that disappeared during the Bush presidency, and it was almost as if what had come about then was a, a sort of a mere desire to hold on to power, and, and the rule, of course, is when all you want to do is hold on to power, you're sure enough uh, to lose it. I think in this uh, uh, election cycle, uh, as I think in the election cycles to come, I think one of the true issues and challenges facing conservatives, conservatives are to ask the, the question, how is conservatism going to help uh, the poor and working Americans. It's a, it's a, and how is conservatism uh, to address the problem of income inequality uh, in this country? I think oftentimes conservatives have shied away from that um, uh, issue. Uh, I think really it's a twofold problem. To some degree it's conservatives fault themselves for sort of shying away from that and sort of not aggressively uh, addressing that problem and dealing with it. I also think it's also a, a, a Conservatives being sort of victim to this the, this sort of myth and this stereotype that all they are concerned about are uh, the rich uh, and the wealthy. But nonetheless, I think it's a real issue that has to be addressed. The conservatives have to be addressed uh, in during the primary season. Uh, at least I was I impressed with uh, uh, Rick Santorum's candidate candidacy, although he was burdened by many other facets. I think he did try to bring this to the fore, his working class conservatism, this notion that, that we have to um, focus conservatives you know, on, on all aspects on society, and particularly those uh, most in need of it. So that's what I want to talk about today uh, somewhat, is this connection of conservatism uh, with the poor and the working class, and, and how it offers uh, uh, to represent them, how it offers uh, uh, really their best uh, chance for success. Uh, one of the things I want to uh, begin talking about is obviously the um, conservative belief in limited government. I think oftentimes limited government is oftentimes like when, when you pronounce limited government what you're saying is I don't care about anything else. All I want to care about uh, is myself getting as much as I can for myself and, and limited government is equated with helping the rich and powerful and expansive government is equated with really helping those uh, at, at the bottom of the economic uh, ladder, helping those really most in need. Uh, this is uh, a, a, an issue that um, I think has really come to just sort of define this limited government uh, stance. But we're obviously reaching a point of, of real crisis, I think, within our public sector, where we've built up such a debt culture. We've seen what, uh, what Europe uh, is doing um, uh, under uh, President Obama's uh, budget. If, if we forecast that out over the next 10 years, in 10 years, we'll be paying more in terms of interest payments than we do on Social Security right now. This is a problem. There's no question that it's a problem. And I think, in a way, conservatives 
are poised to address this problem, or perhaps much as Democrats or liberals were poised to address the problems of the New Deal. Um, at that point, they were sort of equipped and ready to handle this crisis, I think just in this way that conservatives are equipped and ready to handle this kind of, of crisis now. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, on this particular issue, it's, I think it's the liberal stance that tends to be sort of, if you call it, the regime stance, uh, the, the status quo, the defending um, uh, of the regime in power. And conservatives are the reformist uh, uh, party here, the ones that are looking for ways in which to uh, address this uh, problem. And, uh, and uh, not only to address this problem, to, but to alleviate the, uh, the crisis that uh, is looming uh, uh, forward to it. I think you, you look at the two different creeds, conservatives versus liberals, and, and that's really coming up to define the two, certainly in this election, this, this, this sort of, this one party for expansive government, uh, another party for, um, for limits uh, on government. And I think to some degree, too, also within, uh, within this um, battle, oftentimes, the two sides can go, uh, like with any kind of battle, two sides can go too far. I think it's often said that, um, you know, that conservatives don't believe in government at all. I think that's, of course, that's not true. Conservatives, one of the founding and, and most important beliefs of conservatives is that they believe in traditional uh, historical social institutions. Well, what can be more traditional and historical than this institution of government? Uh, conservatives believe in strong government as provided for in the Constitution, but what they do is they believe in a, a government strong in, in those functions in which it is empowered to, uh, to perform, those functions in which it is best uh, able to perform. And I think also, uh, while, while the left can be sort of um, uh, prone to, uh, to, to maybe going overboard and saying that government uh, doesn't matter at all, and of course it does, I think the left has the opposite problem too, in, in oftentimes proclaiming sort of government as being the dominant or the most important uh, 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 sort of social institution that we have. I think you find that now, even within the politics of today, in which you, you see almost the left sort of setting up this almost this kind of war between government and the private sector and trying to diminish or deny the importance of the private sector so as to sort of build up the importance uh, of the uh, government, the public sector. I'd argue, uh, uh, contrary to the uh, prevailing notion, I think that limited government is something that aids uh, the poor. Uh, that, uh, that by proposing limited government, you propose conditions that are going to help the situation uh, of the poor. I think you can obviously argue the effectiveness of government. Um, if you break down the, uh, the cost of, of uh, all federal government uh, poverty programs, it comes out to about $11,000 per person in poverty, but of course the federal definition of poverty is 18000 some for a family of three, uh, which tells you that if you just simply didn't do anything but distribute the money that is spent in poverty programs, that you'd lift everyone out of the, uh, out of the level of uh, poverty. I think uh, uh, oftentimes government has become our proxy for uh, solutions to social problems. Uh, instead, perhaps, of looking at problems for what they are and how they can truly be solved, we tend to look at government. And, and we tend to see that if there is more spending in government, perhaps, or if government is becoming more involved in a problem than it was before, then we're in fact addressing that problem uh, and the problem is becoming better. I think that's a prominent sort of uh, misconception we're falling into in terms of thinking that, that expansive government then is automatically something that's going to help uh, the poor. Uh, rather than looking at actually what is going on with and what actually can be done uh, in terms of helping the poor. I think government programs uh, uh, oftentimes focus on status uh, rather than on dynamics or future dynamics, rather than on future possibilities. Uh, government is built, is, is, is set up to, to look at status. One, uh, 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 qualifies for government programs in certain ways because of particular status. Uh, but of course, this is the one thing that the poor don't want to focus on, is status. And oftentimes when you have these programs, and if they're focusing on status, 
then they tend to uh, characterize you according to status and instead cre create large incentives or large, at least, factors there um, uh, influencing you and motivating you to sort of stay in that particular uh, status. Uh, and uh, 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 focusing, in, in, in a sense, on the status quo rather than on changing the status quo. Now, there's no question that I think government does a good job, or at least perhaps better than any other institution, in providing safety nets. But I think it's important for us to distinguish safety nets, uh, which ought to catch people uh, from falling and uh, ought to provide a way of sustaining them. But then there has to be a redirection towards then getting them out of that particular situation and helping them, helping them move on and helping them move on to a status uh, in life that they uh, that they'd like to achieve. And on this particular instance, I think government does a rather poor job. Uh, that oftentimes many of our social uh, institutions, are, uh, many of the intermediary institutions in society do a much better in terms of focusing and being more flexible and sort of helping people move up uh, and giving them more of a dynamism. Government, I think, also it tends to be, uh, although it, it, it can do a good job in, in providing a safety net, we count on it to provide a safety net, uh, in some ways I think it's unreliable as a real sort of helper to the poor. And, and in this degree, I think uh, the, the left's own arguments oftentimes work against it. Um, we argue in our society, the left argues that the poor doesn't have any power that they're not only impoverished economically, but politically as well. And yet somehow then we're going to rely on government, which is run by politics, democratic government, which is influenced by politics, to be able to sort of be the savior uh, of the poor. And I think that uh, it is inherently contradictory in terms of looking at a, a group that is politically uh, impoverished to a group that's somehow going to be able to uh, uh, um, sort of receive the benefits of this political type of, of machinery. Uh, I'd argue uh, that the that uh, government and expansive government and big government oftentimes represents and responds to big entities of power. Um, uh, big business uh, is is helped more by big business by big government than is small business. Uh, the bigness of, of government uh, works in connection with the bigness of these uh, particular entities because big government responds to big political power. I think government programs oftentimes have become hijacked then by groups. You see that oftentimes uh, in, in terms of, we talk about it now in terms of crony capitalism, but you see that in terms of, of bailouts frequently. Uh, to think that the, somehow the poor is going to get bailed out, that never really happens. It's, it's the more powerful entities in society that ends up getting bailed out. Uh, those in societies are, end up able to sort of corral the political power to be able to motivate government uh, to help them. Uh, a Congressional Budget Office survey uh, found that over the last 30 years, transfers to the poor have actually declined from 50% down to 30%. So, so the poor are really getting less of a share of these transfers. The middle class and upper class are getting more of their shares of transfer. To me, that makes sense. To me, that makes sense that the people with the more political power are end up getting more from uh, government itself. Uh, and I think also that government failures have, uh, 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 in terms, have their worst consequences on the poor. Uh, the recent uh, uh, housing crisis uh, which uh, uh, many economists argue, obviously many don't, but many argue that they, they were as a result of government programs requiring um, uh, mortgage to, give, to be given, uh, higher mortgages to be given by people that are less able to, to pay for them and who's ultimately, although the government programs were meant to help the poor, who did they end up hurting most? Well, I'd argue that they ended up hurting most was the poor because they ended up losing their home, not only losing their home um, because of the catastrophe, but, but because to the degree that that economic uh, crisis then uh, uh, affected the, uh, the economy, then lost their jobs and suffered uh, politically or economically a lot more so than did the middle class or the more wealthy. One of the things that uh, conservatism uh, uh, promotes uh, with respect to the notion of change, and conservatism does believe in change, but it believes in a different kind of change than does liberalism. 
Uh, the change that conservatives believe in uh, is a change that's directed by the past. Oftentimes, uh, uh, the, the, the difference really between change in terms of the mindset of conservatism and liberalism is that liberalism will, will envision change from a kind of utopian future, from how we would like the future to be perhaps disconnected from the past. The conservatives believe in a change that's directed and consistent with the past. And I think in many respects, you see um, uh, instances which uh, clearly just, uh, uh, there's been times when conservatives perhaps have been too blinded by the past, um, uh, and which has inhibited them from moving forward with necessary changes. But I think what we lose track of in terms of the liberal uh, prescriptions for change uh, is that rapid change, sort of untested change, change that isn't in accordance with our our historical practices and institutions really end up hurting the poor the most. One of the things I, I, I think about uh, as a good example of that is that all across the country during the 1960s there was the experiment with high-rise uh, 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 urban public housing um, and they were built up and we don't see that. You don't, you, you don't see the, that housing at all anymore because it ended up to have a disastrous effect. Uh, on the people uh, who live there in, in terms of putting uh, 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 young families, uh, single parent families, uh, children uh, into the same sort of crowded conditions uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 violent uh, criminals, with uh, uh, drug dealers. It was not something that ended up being uh, 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 helpful uh, to the people who were living there. I think likewise we're seeing this already in in uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, bill in terms of the reform of, of financial services. It's a good idea to reform financial services industry when we've just had a kind of banking crisis that led to the second worst economic uh, downturn in the last century. But uh, that kind of, the, the kind of regulation ought to be in connection with what we have uh, with, with, with our current sort of uh, 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 historical institutions and practices. I think what we're discovering with Don Frank is all of these different uh, effects that we really didn't envision, one of which in many ways are driving uh, small community banks out of lower income areas. And so even though the, then we can claim that society has the protection of these regulations, it's really the poor then that is actually losing access to uh, banking services. What conservatism uh, uh, promotes uh, is a um, really a growth culture uh, in connect, uh, as contrast to a dependency culture. Uh, I think it, a, a good example of this is really when, when you see immigrants and when, and when you take surveys of immigrants coming to this country, immigrants do not come to the country, uh, do not come to the society and talk about a society be sort of being defined by public sector and be defined by public sector dependency uh, either in an entitlement ki kind of culture or even in an employment type of, of culture. And I think we've never seen a society really that, that uh, in the history of, of, the, of the world that's been able to provide a dynamic growth culture if it's dominated by a, a, and largely influenced by the public sector. It's the private sector that promotes and provides for this kind of dynamism. And of course it's the poor that needs that kind of dynamism. Um, uh, neither the poor nor immigrants set out to sort of say we want to sort of solidify ourselves in the status quo. They are the ones who most want uh, a, a type of change and a type of dynamism. It's really the rich and the wealthy, uh, people like Warren Buffett, who want the status quo. That's what they, uh, they, they want that because really for them there's really only one way to go in life and it's not up. They're already up. Um, so I, I think that's an, an important uh, uh, distinction um, and, and in effect in a way, I mean even definitionally, it's hard to become independent of government in a government type of controlled society. Uh, in terms of uh, I think empowering uh, individuals to, uh, to uh, uh, become free of government, to be able to become independent enough to define their own uh, future and condition in life. Uh, uh, take for instance in the, uh, in the realm of education. And I think this is another good way of, of illustrating the fact that so oftentimes we look at government as proxy. Uh, 
And when we, we ask about the state of, of uh, education uh, in the United States, we really look at the state of spending on it. How much it's been spending? What are we spending? Uh, and we equate that. If we're willing to spend more, we're for education. Uh, and if we don't want to spend more, we're against uh, education. But really, I think in a way, this turns out to be sort of a false indication of the state of education, as well as almost a, a sort of a, a, a commitment, just a rigid commitment to the government as educator, again, without looking at the actual state of, of education. I think in terms of notions of, of, of freedom and opportunity and of trying to give the poor the same type of, of opportunity as do wealthier uh, individuals. I think uh, conservative prescriptions, for instance, for voucher programs really fit into that in terms of letting people and allowing people and empowering people to get the education that they want uh, and, they, and they choose. Uh, even, I think, on the issue of, and oftentimes we see conservatism and liberalism uh, uh, differentiated by uh, 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 stand on either sort of individual rights or social or public uh, values. I think when it comes to the poor oftentimes, uh, 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 I think uh, conservatism tries to balance this notion of individual freedom, individual rights, along with communal rights and communal uh, interests. And, and it is important, I think it's, it's oftentimes the, the rich again that want individual rights because that's, they don't need as much community, they don't need as much sort of communal solidarity uh, as do the poor. The wealthy can become more rights oriented, but the poor oftentimes rights are not the first thing on their uh, agenda. The first thing on their agenda might be able to have a safe public uh, transport system to get to and from work to have safe streets so that their children can get to and from school, to have schools that maybe aren't defined by due process rights of students, but actually defined by what the students are actually receiving in that education, because the poor isn't going to have a second chance at education. They're not going to have, they're not going to have tutors. They're not going to have private schools that perhaps they can uh, be able to go to if things don't work out for them uh, in their uh, own particular uh, schools. Uh, oftentimes, liberalism has become identified as, as promoting an individualistic or even an adversarial type of culture, uh, whereas conservatives are, are noted as uh, adhering to this old notion of an assimilation culture. But again, the poor need a culture in which there's a degree of assimilation. The poor don't want to sort of be left out on their own, sort of cast free to saying, here you can have your own sort of segment in society and have your own type of identity. They want to be assimilated because if anything they want, again, to have this sort of solidarity with the better off members of society and to create this kind of solidarity so that the better off members of society not only feel more responsible but are more willing to participate with the poor into creating a, a society that's more conducive to their, um, uh, to their advancement. <clears throat> Lastly, I'll, I'll uh, bring up a notion that, that uh, I think well defines the difference between conservatives uh, and, and liberals. I think oftentimes in terms of poverty, uh, liberals look at, at, at poverty from a very sort of uh, uh, myopic viewpoint, from a, a materialistic or economic uh, viewpoint. Uh, I'd argue that conservatives look at it from a much more general uh, and all-encompassing type of, of viewpoint. Uh, and in that respect, I think conservatives tend to look then at not only just the social cap or the economic capital belonging to the poor, but like the cultural and social capital that are, uh, uh, that are uh, possessed by the poor. And what's striking really is that while the left, say over the really since the New Deal, um, and certainly during the 1960s, uh, have tried to promote the, a significant economic redistribution in favor of the poor through, um, uh, through its tax and government uh, spending programs. At the same time that's done that, it's really helped to facilitate a cultural redistribution away from the poor. And I think this is illustrated in Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, in which he looks at the sort of the, the better off uh, uh, segment of society uh, adhering to traditional uh, moral, social, cu cultural cap uh, uh, values, whereas the, 
the, uh, the, the poor uh, and the lower uh, uh, classes in society tend to be uh, dysfunctional and have, if anything, have really abandoned the traditional social and cultural capital of the, of the past. And hence are, are experiencing sort of more personal breakdown, more family breakdown, uh, and in ways which inevitably has uh, 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 an effect on their uh, economic standing. Uh, the rich can, uh, to, to some degree, maybe even to a large degree, afford a degree of personal or family breakdown. The poor can't, uh, and they cannot afford that uh, to that same degree. There was a Brookings study uh, <clears throat> which said that uh, they identified really three factors. Um, and they said that if, if, you get, uh, if you graduate from high school, if you, uh, if you get a full-time job, and if you get married before you have children, you have less than a 2% chance of falling into uh, poverty, regardless of your, uh, your parents' economic uh, uh, history, regardless of the, of the economic background uh, uh, that you uh, occupied prior to getting that job, prior to graduating from high school. And I think that really does show that there's so much more to the success and the life condition of the poor than simply their current uh, economic uh, uh, status. And in fact, their economic status may be well determined by these social, cultural, and, and moral capital, uh, which, is what the, which, what, which is what conservatism tries to facilitate uh, and strengthen. I want to leave some time for questions, so with that, um, um, I should, I should have sort of warned you in advance all of a sudden, I, many times I, I listen to a speaker and before I know it, they're looking at the clock and they decide to end and, and call for questions and, 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 and it's really only till like you walk out the door when you think of, hey, I, I thought of something. So uh, 10 minutes ago, I should have given you the warning, but unfortunately I'm, I'm giving you the, uh, the notice now. So if you have any questions, I'd love to entertain them. Well, you know, that's almost beyond me to try to answer that to some degree. I'll say one thing good about the political scene because we oftentimes never say anything good about the political scene. I'll say this good about it is that I don't see it a problem. We're having a very, you know, intense battle. Uh, and, and some, uh, and many people say we're very divided. You know, I think it's, it's bad to be divided as a society along social and cultural. Grounds. I don't think it's so bad to be divided on political grounds. And when you look back at the, uh, uh, America's political history, you find a lot of instances in the past in which politics has been much more mean-spirited, if you will, much more divisive. Uh, and that's sort of the nature of it. So I'm not particularly, uh, you, you know, I'm not particularly worried uh, in that instance. I think the, the, the vibrant politics is also a sign of a, of a healthy society. Uh, again, it's, we, we, we have to have a certain level of, of unity, I think, on a social and cultural uh, ground. But um, uh, in, in that respect, uh, you know, I don't think it's as worrisome oftentimes. We, uh, the, many people sort of decried uh, Congress's uh, grappling with the, uh, the debt limit. Um, and how they, they took it right up to the very end before, you know, reaching some kind of compromise. Uh, you know, again, I mean, that's how politics works. Actually, that's how most people work, is just to sort of delay a problem, you know, until the final moment. The point is, is that, that a resolution was reached. So uh, I think what we're having now is really a healthy debate. And uh, for those of us that can sort of remember back to the 1980s when oftentimes the media decried the kind of politics we had. We, we tended to, like they'd say, we focus on cultural hot button issues. Issues that really have very little effect on the lives of most people on a day to day basis. Uh, but you can't say that about now. I think you can't say that about the elections of 2010. We are really debating some very prominent political and constitutional issues. The notion of limited government. Uh, notions of, of federalism. Really things in our constitution that um, that, uh, 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 you know, are, are structural, things that you don't oftentimes think of defining a political campaign. You think of political campaigns being defined by issues that bring out a lot of passion. 
So I think those are all good things. So what would I do uh, to change to some degree? I, I guess I'd focus, I guess I'd focus um, more so on, on, um, on conservatives. Uh, if anything, I, I guess I'd, I'd focus on the different parties trying to be perhaps truer to, you know, maybe their core beliefs. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, I'd, I'd focus on, on liberals being, being closer to what I think their beliefs are, are ranging from in terms of a more sort of like public sector oriented society uh, and economy. Uh, and at the same time, I'd, I'd have a criticism for uh, fellow conservatives really, is that I, I think they really do need to start, and, and maybe they're not doing it now, but, but they do need to sort of become much more, uh, I think, aggressive towards uh, reaching out to, and reaching their message out to the, uh, to the poor and the working class, and, and, and uh, uh, I don't think the middle class, and they try to do that, but I think they need to do that, and I think if anything, perhaps, they have become sort of shell-shocked about that because they feel as if they're always going, they're, they're sort of always on the defensive uh, in that respect. I think they need to be far more uh, aggressive about it, and, and they really need to sort of change the dialogue to some degree on that. That was a very long-winded answer to your question. I'm not sure how responsive it is, but uh, yes? You, you talked about uh, the unintended consequences of the Dodd-Frank Act in relation to how that's affecting financing options, banking options for the poor. Uh, if you were to reform that uh, in a way uh, that would give better options, what, what would that look like? Yeah, I couldn't, you know, that's kind of like, I'm very critical of Obamacare, and luckily after this last debate I can say Obamacare, I don't like to sound disrespectful, but since the President likes that term, good. It's, it's a lot easier than always talking about the actual legislation itself. You know, it's not something I can tell you now in terms of what I would promote as a, um, as a regulatory scheme. I think there's a lot of problems in it. And I think in, if, in, if in any way, what, what our politics tend to do is when we have a problem, we rush to have government solve it. Uh, but that's normal. I mean, that's expected. That's normal. If anything, I think uh, it, it's a problem. It, it's, a, it's a constitutional problem. You know, the Constitution is set up to provide sort of checks on these time periods when we want to perhaps rush to some kind of conclusion. We want to rush to maybe to give a lot of power, for instance, to the federal executive branch in order to solve a particular problem. It, it, these, these kinds of checks. The more that, that we diluted those kinds of checks, the more that naturally I think we as a society, when a problem occurs, we, we, we rush to a conclusion. Uh, I think in many respects the answer to the Dodd-Frank bill is, is a sort of a more structural concern like, you know, yes, there was a problem. Um, but when you look at how fast sort of the problem was sort of resolved through that process, I don't think we could have begun to really understand the intricacies of everything that was involved. So it's difficult in a um, uh, it's difficult in a uh, in, in a democracy to sort of hold back during times of crisis. But it's also, I think, I'd argue when you look back at the New Deal, you know, we didn't hold back in times of crisis and. Uh, and I can perfectly understand that, but we should have. And if we would have held back, perhaps we wouldn't have sort of been left with the, the legacy that we now have that's, that's, uh, that's evolved from that. So, uh, you know, what would I have done from a Dodd-Frank perspective? I think, but again, this was a coming at a time when the Republican Party was weak, conservatism was weak, but conservatives and Republicans have to be able to uh, offer some kind of alternative for the public, some kind of roadmap for them to go, and it really wasn't. Now, I think Dodd-Frank was a mistake, but there was no other sort of alternative sort of laid out in terms of, here's a problem. And I'm also a little unsympathetic, you know, to private business who, who that argues don't regulate us. Well, if they make mistakes to a large, if they make the kind of mistakes that we saw made in the financial services sector, one can hardly, you know, uh, sort of entertain their call to, you know, leave us alone. Um, so uh, I think one of the big problems with Dodd-Frank is the notion that it's really solidifying, and it, I think it's creating the seeds of bigger problems because this whole notion of too big to fail, it's kind of enshrining within that. 
Uh, it's many of the, for instance, banks that acted very responsibly that are getting hurt the most because they cannot afford even knowing and keeping up with regulations like big banks to, 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 to big corporations, government regulation is a good thing because it helps them sort of win in competition against smaller entities. Yeah, Chris. In what ways do you see conservatives mischaracterize their arguments in ways that add to a belief that they have contempt for the lower privileged elements of society? Well, I think it, one way they don't do it is I think that ought to always be a starting point. You know, I just think that ought to be a starting point for the the argument. You know, you know, how is it that um, how is it that our policies then are going to help someone? Uh, help someone who's uh, uh, currently without a job, uh, maybe without many prospects of a job, maybe uh, who comes from sort of a, a history of poverty, how are we going to help them out? You know, how are we going to help them thrive? How, how, what are we going to do about, um, uh, how are our prescriptions going to uh, um, help this uh, and, and, and minimize the, uh, the disparity in income inequality? I think a, a big part of it is, like I've tried to lay out here and that I do more so in my book, is to argue that I think conservatives have the answer. They're just after so many decades of not giving the answer and of so many decades of sort of being uh, accused of being concerned only with the rich and powerful that, um, that they just, uh, you know, sort of aren't making that argument. And I think, too, the more that they shift their lens to the working class, the lower working class, the poor, uh, the more that they're going to be able to, you know, uh, come up with better policies. But they have to. I mean, that's, it's, it's not a situation in which, you know, conservatives either should or should want to represent only those people who have kind of made it. You want to protect the people who have made it, and you also want to create the conditions in which people can make it. Well, I mean, I, I'm a believer in vouchers, for instance, um, uh, because I, I don't know that I would, I, I'm hesitant to come up again, sort of being a conservative, I'm hesitant to come up with again with a law that's going to take care of everything. What I'd like to be able to do is equalize opportunity, give people the same opportunity. Uh, I mean, conservatives don't believe in equality in result, but uh, we, we believe in equality in terms of opportunity. And I think education is, is one of the key places in which we as, we as a society can sort of foster that type of equality. I don't know of anything that, that does it better, really, than some kind of voucher system that allows people to make a choice of where they're going to where they're going to be read, uh, educated, how they're going to be educated, give them the same uh, chance at uh, an educational opportunity as, as do the wealthy. So uh, I focus on that a lot in terms of, again, uh, uh, I I instead of taking, I instead of sort of being rigidly locked, and I believe in uh, public education, but, but you know, it, it just, we, we haven't been able to, to create a, a, an educational environment that's really been, uh, that the more we've spent, we spend a tremendous amount on it. We haven't seemed to make progress. Uh, in the actual, you know, education parameters. Yes. In regards to public housing, for example, I know you mentioned that the high-rise co-ops didn't work very well. I know Crew and I know in, in St. Louis, I mean, Korea, right here in Chicago, uh, were demolished over the last, you know, two decades or so. But, you know, there's still cities where high-rise co-ops still exist, and there's still always, you know, kind of that need for public housing. Um, what is, what is the correct response from the conservative perspective on public housing? Is it a private sector option, or is it what's kind of happening where you redistribute people mostly out of uh, urban areas and into outer rural areas? You know, I, I guess I'd say with, with anything, a conservative response is hopefully you create the conditions where people can have an effective choice for themselves. Uh, 
rather than trying to figure out where are we going to channel people, where are we going to funnel people, um, how are we going to create a housing situation where we can funnel people here. Maybe they don't want to go there. You know, and I, I do think that tends to be a very sort of patronizing attitude that we take oftentimes to the poor. Where are we going to put them? You know, where are we going to put them? Well, how about letting them, how about letting them decide? Now, granted, that's idealistic when we say, how about, you know, let them decide where they want to go. But I think the main instance, the first impulse has to be not to decide where they're going to go, but, but how can we structure our economy and our society? What can we do with our society and economy such that to give them the tools to be able to decide where they're going to go? Um, so uh, uh, my prescriptions are really sort of less for some overall, you know, uh, oftentimes kind of a one-size-fits-all remedy to it in which we can funnel people into certain positions. Because again, I'm also concerned with, and looking back at, at the history of, of, of public sector programs, that that oftentimes to uh, encase a kind of status quo orientation, that, that, that you get there and it's hard to move out, you know. Uh, granted, government can provide you with a home and maybe you're out on the street and you need that. And I think we always need to remember um, uh, that, uh, that uh, very few conservatives I know say just cut off all government funding, cut off all government programs. Uh, in fact, the, the, the conservative response is not to cut off all government sort of existing programs because after all, the programs we have now are the result of a kind of social contract we've made with society. And it's breaking the social contract if we say, okay, you know, uh, you had this entitlement program, for instance, before, now we're ending it for you. I mean, that's a breaking of a, sort of a promise that government's made to society. So it, it's nothing that's going to happen very immediately. Uh, but um, uh, I think oftentimes what, what happens is that, that, that sort of big government plans tends to encase people in a situation in life that, that they end up not wanting to be encased in, that they want to have, be able to have more flexibility. So I, I think like many conservatives would say that the answer to a housing problem is the economy problem. Uh, allow people to be able to have better jobs and to be, to be able to progress economically more so that in fact they can have more power over their particular housing uh, situation. But I, I'm also not reflexively uh, uh, opposed to, you know, government programs that help people to have houses. You, you, you have to get people housed. You can't have people homeless. You have to get people in housing. But in doing so, and this is very difficult for government to do, I think, is how do you build kind of an escape hatch out of that? What government can't do is kind of build an ending point. We're going to do this to help you for a while, but when oftentimes instead of a while, it just means permanent. Yes. Uh, going back to education, what do you think about charter schools along with the vouchers? So schools that are publicly, publicly funded but privately managed. Well, I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of any sort of flexible type of approach to it. Uh, uh, I think people should have, you know, as, as much freedom to be able, uh, again, like to repeat, in, in the area of education, to get the best education uh, possible for them. Um, and, and, you know, I think uh, experimentation, after all, is kind of a key component uh, of the conservative mentality. We don't think of it in terms of government uh, 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 experimentation solely. I think we, we see as experimentation as another word for competition. Conservatives value federalism, and one of the reasons we value federalism is because it allows kind of a a, a 50 state laboratory kind of laboratories of experimentation. You have 50 different states, each able to experiment to some degree in, uh, in designing their own social programs for their own constituencies. So I oftentimes think experimentation in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, conservative mentality is akin to competition, and I think conservatives are very open to experimentation. Um, sometimes. Uh, we don't come across like that because we're unwilling to have government be kind of the monopolizing experimenter. I don't necessarily want to come up with a program where government's going to be making a big change, a big experiment, but it's solely in control of that. And so if it makes a bad move, a bad experiment, there's almost, there's very little way to correct that. 
but I'm very in favor of experimentations at levels where if something goes wrong, you, you quit it or you change it. Just like when something goes right, you keep doing it and doing it better. So, you know, I'm in favor of experimentation. I hate to cut it short. I think, as I said, we lost the room at the turn of the hour, so um, we'll probably have to end it here. Um, just want to say thanks again, Professor Gary, for taking the time to come down here and speak and take questions. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be available afterwards, but um, that's Sure, I'll hang around down here if anybody wants to talk. Sounds great. Well, thanks again. And Thank you. Uh,